um, taking the mark of the beast has no has no middle ground no excuse nothing of that nature reason for taking it is not important let me read scripture to you Revelation chapter 14 from verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb think about that i think i should read it to you again the word says and the angel the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if any man and notice that he says it with a loud voice if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name and i told you the reason for it i already told you the reason for it it's not something that anybody should somehow take and say oh i didn't know it's got nothing to do with it. And here's the point. You take that mark, you can't reverse it. You can't take it and untake it. You can't reverse the process. Understand this. I, I'll, I, I'll discuss it in other details. But the mark of the beast is supposed to bring you into what you may call global citizenship. It's a trick. It's a trick. It's supposed to bring you into global citizenship. You take it and you, you have an ID, an identity that brings you, that gives you a national global ID. In fact, it takes you away from your local citizenship where you say, oh, I am from such and such a country. It's supposed to actually give you a global identity. These are all the tricks. It's nice. It's wonderful. You will have a global identity no matter where you go in this world, blah, 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 blah. Look at the Bible. God warned us already. And I did tell you about the coming of the Lord. And I gave you from the scriptures several ways that you can calculate to know what period is the coming of Christ. All right? Now, it is true that some people said, maybe 20 years ago, that that was when Christ was going to come. Some said maybe 40 years ago. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of people were saying those things not because they studied the Scriptures. They didn't study the Scriptures. They didn't bring their information from the Scriptures. They brought those things from their heads. Because it's very simple. I've, I've shared them with you. I've given you the information. 
And I said, do your own calculation. It's all there. This same Bible. And tell me whether you would come up with anything 40 years ago. It's impossible. It's impossible to know the scriptures and come up with such, uh, you know, failed calculations and uh, uh, postulations. The reality is, the church was given 2,000 years from when Jesus walked away from that temple. And I showed it to you from the scriptures. Calculate 2,000 years from that time. And here's an interesting uh, reality. What year was that? Jesus would be going through the scriptures. Jesus would be at that time somewhere around 33 years old. All right? Well, not really 33. In using the Gregorian calendar, he would be somewhere, somewhere, maybe close. He started his ministry at age 30. The Bible says about, he was about 30 years old. So we may not pinpoint the 30-year age as the zero point because he uses the term about 30 years old. Okay? So if it was about 30 years old, it may be matters of months because there's such specific detail in the Bible that um, he would not go so far away. And so if his ministry was for about three years, then we go again and say about 33 years old. So there is the area of um, not being sure of the day or the hour. And that's all he said. We don't know the day or the hour in which he comes. But I didn't say that we can't be very close. We can be close. We can, even, we, we can even be as close to knowing the year. Because he didn't say that year, no, no man. And here's another thing. When was Jesus born? Jesus was born at about... Two AD, sorry, BC, two BC. That means two years before the AD one. So, and you know, when you call the one, you call it one inclusive. So, if you, if Jesus were, was born somewhere around. 2 BC. Some would say 3 BC. Some have even said 4 BC. Okay? But it is actually closest to 2 BC because of several other, several other pointers of history. And when you look at the scriptures. Now here is the interesting thing. That will mean that if you're counting those 2,000 years, you're going to begin from A.D. Uh, 31, thereabouts. From A.D. 31, somewhere. I want you to have that perspective in mind for, for a moment. And then, go to the other things that I told you. When you put this aside, and you go to when 
the fig tree, when, the, when, when its, its branch is yet tender, he says, you know that summer is near. And I told you he was referring to Israel. And he let us know Israel will have to be a nation. Because he tells us that the Antichrist will sign a treaty with Israel and with many. And that treaty begins the seven-year period, which will lead, those will be the last seven years of Daniel's 70 weeks. That's the last week, the one we call the 70th week. The church comes in between the 69th week and the 70th week. And I'm, I've told you from the scriptures that the period between the 69th week and the 70th week is 2,000 years. Now, let's put that aside and let's head into Israel becoming a nation because it says this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And I said from the scriptures again, a generation is a hundred years. If a generation is a hundred years, and you do your own calculation, Israel became a state again from 1948. Now somebody had asked a question about uh, what I said about the different, the different powers, uh, empires that ruled over Israel. And they said, oh, but pastor, you didn't talk about the Byzantine and the Ottoman empires. Oh, what about them? Well, we didn't talk about them because they only came into Jerusalem after the dispersion, which means they were not dealing with the nation of Israel. The nation was already dispersed. So that's why that's what they're not mentioned. All right, so if you do your calculation 100 years from 1948, take that in, and then remember, that one includes the seven years, because it's the, it's the calendar, it's Israel's calendar, it's God dealing with Israel. So take 1948 in there, and run your 100 years from there and tell me where you get to and plug in your seven years from the other end knowing that it's part of the hundred tell us where how much you would come to almost exactly the same amount of time left in the first one that i told you of the the 2000 and this other one of the 100 how can you come in with two things so unrelated and yet you come up with the same figures. Approximately the same figures. Well, the, um, what we're just talking about there is the closeness of the Lord's coming. And that any time before now would have only been some speculation. All right? But it is so close so close and there's a difference between the second coming of christ you see when, when the bible talks about the coming of the lord he refers to two different um uh two different advents okay he's talking about what we refer to as coming the coming of the Lord in which he really doesn't come to the earth. But it is also called the coming of the Lord. It's the, the, the context that will help you understand which is which. So we say 
the Lord is coming, but we don't call it the second coming for a reason. He doesn't come to the earth. Instead, we meet him in the air. That's called the rapture of the church. Then is the second one which we generally refer to as the second advent because it comes to the earth. In that one, he comes all the way to the earth and his saints and his angels come with him. Those who weren't with him before come back with him. So that's the one that's more appropriately referred to as the second coming of Christ. Because he actually does arrive to the world. Which he doesn't do at the rapture. At the rapture, he comes to the air. He is in the clouds. So we get out of here. At the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ would rise first. And we that are alive and remain here will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds. And we go away for all that period when the tribulation is taking place. We are not here. We are not here. We don't face the tribulation. There's a question here as to um, somebody said that... Uh, uh, let me quickly pick it. Uh, Samuel from Ghana. I, I, just, I saw your question uh, while I was looking through a moment ago. And you said, um, you said in the global prayer day that the church will not pass through the tribulation. But the book of Matthew 24 from verse 21 to 22 and Matthew 24, 29 to 31 talks about the elect of God passing through the great tribulation. Can you please throw more light on this? Okay, I'm doing so now, Samuel. Um, the church will not pass through the great tribulation. So you say, so who are the saints or who are the elect of God that will go through the great tribulation? First, let me explain what you mean by the elect. The elect is a term that's applicable to Jesus Christ. He's called my elect. All right? God calls him his elect. You'd see that is applicable to Jewish believers, those who follow him. He's talking about the Jews, all right? Then it's also applicable to God's people in the New Testament. So when you see the term, the elect, it depends on what period is being referred to. If he's referring to the period of the tribulation, then the elect there are of two kinds. One, the Jewish elect. That's the Jewish people. Two, you have those who would believe in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. For the Bible tells us that a great multitude, which no man could number, a great multitude came through the great tribulation. Of course they would. I mean, they understand that it's about heaven or hell. So they're ready now because they knew others left. And they don't, they don't want to take a chance. So no matter what you do to them, you're going to well, I'll follow Jesus.